This evening we're continuing our 13-year series, Preaching Through the Bible, and we're in Psalm 31, verses 1 through 24. Every human weakness is an opportunity to trust in God's strength. The awareness of personal impotence should always lead the believer to cast himself on divine omnipotence. This was David's experience as recorded in Psalm 31. He found himself in yet another painful experience of life, and this ordeal drove him to trust God and his power more fully. In this sense, when he was weak, then he was strong. On this particular occasion, David was confronted with a conspiracy so powerful that even his closest friends and most ardent supporters had abandoned him. Alone and forsaken, he found himself emo emotionally distressed and physically drained with no one to turn to but God. And you know, for a Christian, that's a good place to be with no one to turn to but God. Filled with deep anxiety, David had to trust in the Lord. His anguish was transformed into assurance. This psalm conveys an unwavering trust in God as the psalmist rejoiced in the all-sufficient resources of God. This psalm of David was probably to be used by the director of music in temple worship, either sung by a soloist or by the choir. So first of all, we have David's plea in verses 1 through 5, beginning in verse 1 and 2. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Bow down thine ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock for a house of defense to save me. This psalm begins with David's urgent plea to God, asking that he listen to his cry and rescue him from his enemies. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. For David, God was his protection from the assault of his enemies. Bow down thine ear to me was a bold request that God would pay attention to him. David declared, Be thou my strong rock for a house of defense to save me. The repetition of these strong synonyms for God conveys the intensity of the psalmist's trust in him. Then asking God to be a house of defense to save me, David was trusting in God as his ultimate defense. And although David had often taken refuge among the rocks of the wilderness, recorded in 1 Samuel 23, 25, and chapter 24 and verse 2, his true security was found in the Lord, the rock of his salvation. And then in verses 3 and 4, For thou art my rock and my fortress, therefore for thy name's sake lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net that they have laid privily for me, for thou art my strength. The phrase, since you are my rock and my fortress, is a restatement of the previous verse. God would guide David after setting him free from the trap, the net that was set for him. And David asked this so he might pursue God's will. It was to this mighty God that David cried out for deliverance. The grounds of this appeal were not his own goodness, but God's righteousness. He asked this not for his own reputation, but for the sake of the name of the Lord. 
Verse 5. Into thy hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. In an expression of total trust in God, David prayed, Into your hands I command and commit my spirit. It was a passage later quoted by one greater than David. The Lord Jesus as he hung on the cross in Luke chapter 23 verse 46. The psalmist had chosen literally to deposit his life into the Lord's hands. This is a picture of total reliance on God. Thou hast redeemed me, David cried out, O Lord God of truth. God has promised to help his people and he cannot lie. Titus chapter 1 verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. That word hope confuses some people. They think if somebody hopes, that means that it might or might not come true. But the Bible is very clear in the Greek here. The word hope is an anticipation. I'm hoping, I'm anticipating that this is going to happen. It's not a question of whether it would happen or not because God, you see, promised it before the world began. And God keeps his promises. And not only David's plea, but David's passion. Verses 6 through 8. I have hated them that regard lying vanities, but I trust in the Lord. I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy, for thou hast considered my trouble. Thou hast known my soul in adversities. God had known David's life. He observed it. He saw the times that David had adversaries against him. And he knew his soul as he went through those adversities. And hast not shut me up into the hand of the enemy. Thou hast set my feet in a large room. David next revealed the driving passion behind his prayer. A zeal and jealousy for the honor of God's holy name. He declared, I have hated them that regarded lying vanities. He rejected those who rejected God. In this sense, he refused to be associated with the evil lifestyles and wicked beliefs of the godless. He vowed to be glad and rejoice in God's love. This he did because he knew that God saw his affliction and knew his anguish. He believed that God would set his feet in a large room, meeting a large place for firm footing where he could escape the threats and dangers that had hemmed him in. And not only David's plea and passion, but David's pain, verses 9 through 13. We began in verses 9 and 10. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eye is consumed with grief, yea, my soul and my belly. For my life is spent with grief, and my years with sighing. My strength faileth because of my iniquity, and my bones are consumed. In his troubles, David was devastated and drained emotionally, physically, and mentally. His eyes were weak with sorrow, implying tears. His soul and body were filled with grief and drained of vitality. His life was consumed with anguish. All strength had left him. His feeling of confidence had temporarily left him. Now verses 11 through 13. I was a reproach among all mine enemies, but especially among my neighbors, and a fear to mine acquaintance. They did see me without, fled from me. You saw me outside and the people were scared they'd run from me. 
said, I am forgotten as a dead man out of mind. I'm like a broken vessel. For I have heard the slander of many. Fear was on every side while they took counsel together against me. They devised to take away my life. And what's more, David declared, I am the utter contempt of my neighbors, even a dread, a reproach to his friends and enemies alike. His friends had abandoned him like a piece of broken pottery. That is, he was cast aside by them. So downcast and disgraced, he stated that the slander by his enemies, as well as their attempts to conspire and plot to take his life, were strong. The most frequent weapon used against the psalmist was the tongue. So much for the child's little rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Words of slander can certainly hurt in many, many ways. And not only David's plea, passion, and pain, but David's petition, verses 14 through 18, and we'll first address verse 14 through 16. But I trusted in thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my God. My times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant. Save me for thy mercy's sake. In spite of this persecution, David's trust in the Lord was unwavering. He relied on God to deliver him from his enemies. He prayed, My times are in your hands recognizing that all the events and circumstances of, of his life were under God's sovereign control, which is tempered by his unfailing love. Therefore, let your face shine on your servant is a request for divine favor. Then verses 17 and 18. Let me not be ashamed, O Lord, for I have called upon thee, let the wicked be ashamed, and let them be silent in the grave. Let the lying lips be put to silence, which speak grievous things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. The phrase, let me not be put to shame, indicates the dishonor that would result if David's enemies should succeed in their conspiracy against him. David wanted the wicked to be put to shame and to lie silent in the grave rather than allowing him to be silenced in death. Their lying lips, which had slandered him, must be silenced because they had spoken arrogantly against one of the righteous, namely himself. So rather than taking vengeance into his own hands, he left the dispensing of God's wrath to God. And not only David's plea, passion, pain, and petition, but David's praise. Verses 19 through 22. And first we'll look at verses 19 and 20. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. As David waited for a divine deliverance, his heart was filled with praise for God's goodness and great all-sufficient supply of grace stored up, freely shared with those who fear him. He was confident that God himself in the shelter of his presence would hide him from the plots of evil men. Verses 21 and 22. Blessed be the Lord, for he has showed me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. On the basis of God's goodness, David exclaimed, Praise be to the Lord, for he showed his wonderful love to me. 
And when he was under great danger, during his threatening trial pictured as a besieged city, God remained faithful. At times, David panicked and cried out to God, I'm cut off from your sight. Nevertheless, his heart would rally, and he would say, Yet you heard my cry for mercy. Thus David gave praise to God in anticipation of God's help and deliverance. And not only David's plea, passion, pain, petition, and praise, but finally David's proclamation. Verses 23 and 24. O oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints. For the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. Having offered praise to God, David next preached to others, calling all his saints to love the Lord with all their heart, soul, and strength. All God's people should adore God because he preserves the faithful when they are abandoned and attacked. But the proud, referring to those who rise up in arrogance and harm the godly, refusing to submit themselves to the Lord. But God will pay back those who are proud. Vengeance belongs to the Lord, says Romans 12, 19. Therefore we should be strong and take heart in the Lord because He will defend those who hope in Him. All believers, to some degree, will be surrounded by evil people who work against them. So we must continually remind ourselves that all the events of our lives are being orchestrated and executed in the perfect will and timing of God. Likewise, we must recall the great goodness of God, which is stored up for His elect. The Lord himself will, pres will preserve the faithful so they will weather the storm in which they find themselves. The Lord delights in showing his preserving power to the weakest vessels. The believer must not be downcast, but he should take courage knowing that his infinite God is much larger than the finite people who threaten him. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful passage of King David, inspired by the Holy Spirit, coming down to us this evening from 3,000 years ago. And let us realize that God is always on our side. God is our strength. He is our banner. He is our God. And all of our love is placed upon him. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.